świątynię, kolejną, którą jest kuczą pana Szyby. Ja, ale nie mamy na co, jakby własny język, on się czytał Holis i zapytał. I kompilator do niego i jakby ten system faktycznie działał. I no i znowu się jakoś tam wprowadził e, hymny na Twitchu i ludzie się mu zwrócali. Ale to sobie nie pomoże. No się nie chciał się za bardzo leczyć, bo tam ojciec się nie leczył, że się tam leczył i później był jakiś bezdomny i umarł tam. No ale no, niektóre jego momenty, że przyjmą są na wieczne. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Can I have your attention, please? Um, Mateusz. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the fifth edition of our Alexir Community Krakow Meetup. 
as usual, um, you can uh, feel free to grab a beer from the refrigerator back there. Um, you can find the restrooms by the uh, elevators. Um, and uh, yeah, we can start with the with the today's uh, lineup. First presentation will be delivered online. Um, it will be um, Lars Wilkman, um, the founder of Unterjord. I hope I uh, pronounced that correctly. Uh, Lars, I hope you will um, correct me if I did this wrong. Oh, I can hear you, great. Um, yeah, so uh, if, if everything is ready, um, Lars, can you hear us? Can you say yes. something? Okay. Yeah, great. So we're ready to start. Um, right. Go on. Yeah, it's fine. Oh. something that's cool, I think you need kind of interesting input or a method for generating some, some kind of input. And then you typically need to transform it. And finally, your software needs to produce a different but also interesting output. Many combinations of inputs and outputs are kind of not cool anymore. But that's because they've become normal. So building web forms that capture input, store it in a database, and then list it again in a web browser, that, that's not really cool anymore. Uh, we call it CRUD, and that's the acronym for cool thing. If you actually dig into what it does, of course it's cool somewhere under the hood, but it has no novelty to it at this point. It doesn't challenge anyone's thinking, it doesn't explore new inputs, it doesn't do any new transformations, the output is dull and expected. And I will admit, this is 
is not a, a good personality trait necessarily, but I hunt for approval because my brain just craves novelty. Whiteboard. Slide forward. Space. Uh, so this leads me into Elixir. Not because Elixir is a novelty anymore, but rather because Elixir has fantastic abstractions for dealing with a variety of inputs. Command is all the normal ones, fine. Webhook, API requests, files, web forms. But I've also tried doing raw keyboard events, USB bit devices, chatbot messages, Raspberry Pi hardware, just to name some of the stuff I've tried. And kind of the basic job of polling an API has never met a more helpful abstraction than the gen server. And determining if there's new data, something to react to from a REST API generally means you try requests over and over again and hold some state to figure out if something changes. And you don't necessarily want to bring in a full database with full on validations and persistence just to do that. And the gen server enables lighter solutions and a lot faster prototyping. We can also skip adding a special queue system like RabbitMQ or Redis. We don't need a special worker process at the OS level. Just the Beam merge function provides everything we want. And Elixir makes the Beam easy to wield. And if we bring Phoenix into the mix, that brings PubSub, which simplifies communicating new inputs to whatever process is interested, to whomever it may concern. And inputs are only really fun if they have outputs. And here we've been given the great gift of live view. It makes it trivial to make a UI that reacts to new information where it was previously absolutely doable, but it was so annoying and you had to bring in a front end framework and sort of coordinate that and build a contract layer. Super annoying. And live view instead is just an extremely fun output to work with, especially if you already know HTML, CSS, and your occasional JavaScript, which I do from all my, all my web shenanigans instead of C++. sensors and hardware, and uh, NERVS Livebooks brings both. Yeah. I've done experiments with a bunch of them, probably all of them at this point. And for example, chatbots are an interesting UI paradigm as well that's really accessible from Elixir with Telegram, Slack, or Discord. Just a few of the projects I've built recently. Um, for example, this calendar gadget, as I call it, rather this way around which is an ink screen on top of a Raspberry Pi Zero, uh, which will pull my Google Calendar feed in iCal format, parse it, figure out the current events, show it. Also every now and then. There's nothing fancy about it, but it's actually practical. I've also toyed around with this, which is a macro pad, also nerves, also a Raspberry Pi. Um, and I use that to control the lights in my office for a long time over Wi-Fi. Recently, and if you follow what I do online, you might have seen this, uh, I've played around with this. So this is a USB bit device you mentioned. So this is a Stream Deck Plus. You get eight buttons, which all have screens on them. You get a small touchscreen strip that you can also send things to. And then you get these nice physical tactile knobs, which I can use now to adjust the lighting in my office. Um, and I drive all of that from Elixir. Uh, I wrote a blog post on it if you want to check it out. That's the kind of stuff I find fun, engaging, uh, and cool to explore. I also have built a few Telegram bots because I like the API and I like what it can do. For example, I have used Telegram bots for calling machine learning models at that point through Python. And I showed some of that off during Elixir Call back with it last year. Uh, I just, like last week, built a small telegram bot for my wife so that she can pull some reports that she needs for invoicing. Uh, and that was actually just a practical matter because it didn't need a cron job. 
and I just needed a way for her to trigger it. Uh, it runs on my local machine. Uh, so it's, sometimes it's practical. Uh, another practical one I run is a live view app, which just pulls all the nerves related projects from GitHub, just all the releases and updates, and summarizes that and helps me build the nerves newsletter, which I've published. So there's a variety of but it's all essentially inputs, transformations, and outputs. Next slide. What does membrane bring to the table? So I titled this talk, Lively Membranes. Uh, if you've done audio or video on the web, you're probably aware that those are some opaque and annoying formats. You need to bring in a presenter to do almost anything to them, and you end up Google smithing your way to like this ultimate command line wizardry line, which you just never modify after that. If you need to change it, you'll just get an entirely new one. Like FFmpeg is cool, it's very powerful, it's incredibly flexible, it's a great piece of software in many ways, but it's also really opaque and frustrating. It's not easy to work with. And that's probably mostly due to the formats it works with. Like video is not easy. apart the wizardry into discrete components and then you can tie them together and you can operate on them in a magical way from a laser. So it takes a traditionally very difficult medium and makes it not trivial exactly but workable and simpler. You get to perform your operations from Lixer. Memory will, when needed, work with FFmpeg or weird libraries uh, through NIP bindings. But the intermediate steps are all under your control, and you don't have to shell out to anything. And perhaps most importantly, the process of processing media becomes accessible in Elixir. And that is a major source of fun inputs. So you can work with things like time elapsed and progress. You can measure and indicate audio levels, even creating waveforms. You can dig into bit rates, sample rates, channels. You can slice out thumbnail images, split media streams for preview. You can delay, you can bleep. And then you can output as a file, a live stream, a transcoded output, or pretty much anything else. You have a lot of options at that point. When you have the inputs available to you, the rest is just a matter of creatively applying them. And that's, to me, the fun part. The membrane provides inputs. They call them sources. Uh, it provides outputs. They call them sinks. It also provides transformations, and they call them filters. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, no. It's going to move again. Previous slide. Fingers crossed. Yes. Let's talk about transformations. Inputting something and outputting the same thing is mostly useful if you're shuffling data around. A lot of the time, you want to combine multiple inputs to synthesize a new, more interesting output. Or in some cases, you want to make something available where it previously wasn't. You take your calendar feed, you filter it and mangle it to find the current events. And then you turn that into some text, which is then turned into some kind of pixel drawing that you can then send to a small screen like this one. Some transformations are quite easy, taking an image and shrinking it, taking some text, cutting it down to fit, even taking some text and creating an image with that text on it is something that's offered by a variety of tools. If you are doing transformations with images though, look at the image library in Elixir. It is wildly capable. Uh, I've had tons of fun with it with the Stream Deck. Membrane lets us transform audio and video, and those are challenging, as we mentioned, and it lets us do it in some interesting ways. It's particularly good at getting you the metadata and at transforming from the necessary inputs to the necessary outputs to enable live streaming, which is extra complicated. But live streaming is what it was made for, after all. Um, but it is also useful for many other things. Now, a brief aside in the next slide, There's a new kid in town when it comes to transformations. I'm not a big machine learning enthusiast. Um, 
if anything, a little bit of a skeptic. But there is some undeniable utility in some of those models. And that in that weird world of math, some really messy formats such as human speech can be transformed with a useful of de degree of accuracy into text. Automatic transcription is something I find incredibly useful and it offers a lot of potential possibilities. Machine learning also allows a bunch of other transformations like OCR to turn text into mess into text in images into actual text. It also allows face detection to help you focus on the relevant parts of an image or to apply effects to faces, of course, like bunny ears or whatever you want. Amusingly, just recently, it also allows text to be transformed with very low accuracy into pictures. I don't think anyone has missed stable diffusion entering the scene, but and whether that's useful, practical, is really up for debate, but it does fundamentally do text to image transformation in a very novel way. Now, machine learning is complicated and it requires a fast language, it requires fast tools, and it requires a bunch of math to get anything done. That's why the pre-trained open source models are typically the most interesting to people like me. I just wanna build stuff and try using this. And I have run a few of these models by shelling out to Python. Not the smoothest experience. It does work though. And if there's a new model in town, you can always try it that way. But this is where Bumblebee comes in. Bumblebee takes the promise of numerical elixir, NX, and it provides models that are ready to use in an API, which spares me from all the math. It also eliminates all the other work and it eliminates the entire Python tooling. Uh, I did Python for years. Uh, I'm still happy to, to be rid of that. <laughs> with the initial release of Bumblebee, they launched with Stable Diffusion GPT-2 as the big ones, and then a variety of neat, smaller, probably, models uh, for things like sentiment analysis of text. In this talk, I'm using what I believe is still an unreleased implementation uh, from Bumblebee's main branch of OpenAI's model Whisper. And that does audio to text transcription, as you might have noticed. It is the single most practically useful model I know of. As someone who records a lot of podcasts, being able to generate transcriptions is like witchcraft. <clears throat> I should also mention Evision, the OpenCV bindings project that Coco put together for Elixir, which also offers a bunch of pre-baked computer vision models for use in your Elixir app. It's also super convenient. Next slide. The wild thing about building experiments like this in Elixir and Phoenix is that you can keep it all in your Beam application. I use no extra infrastructure for all of this. Sometimes I need to put it on the server to make it available, but that's it. I'm doing media handling and it's well abstracted. It's flexible and powerful. I'm doing machine learning, well abstracted without needing to know one bit about what I'm doing. I'm doing soft real-time web UI well abstracted with very little effort. And I get standard means of communicating, coordinating between the components of my application, between all these inputs, outputs, and transformations through message passing, you know, just the beam things. These tools are making hard things easier. And that makes them tools that push the boundary of what is cool and challenging. You can see a cool startup like Superbase sell the capabilities of Phoenix as a product to ecosystems where real time is actually challenging. That's a good for them. That's a, that's a nice business idea right there. And if you haven't caught on to it quite yet, this entire presentation is of course a live view application, a beam application. It's a mashup of inputs, transformations and outputs. No particular part of it is very complicated. It's just all about capturing a bunch of inputs, applying some useful transformations and trying to make the outputs as fun as possible. We can unpack this presentation a little bit in the next slide. So what are we doing? We are measuring audio levels using membrane and we use that to produce a waveform <laughs> that you see here in the background. Hopefully you see it. Otherwise, this presentation's losing something. Um, it just draws an SVG. 
And I love playing around with this functionality. It was also ironically one of the most tricky things to get, get right, uh, just from a visual standpoint. We also do a near live transcription of what I'm saying. Actually, we're doing two. So one low latency, poor quality, but near instant transcription, one second at a time. And then another slower, but better transcription using a five second chunk of time. And as we produce the transcriptions, we also take advantage of the transformation from audio to text and look for particular commands. This gives us voice commands that I can use to control these slides, as you might have seen. For example, I have the command clear screen, which resets the uh, transcription, it resets the audio levels, and then it keeps streaming. This is just a mix of parlor tricks and things that look fancy, but it's bundled up with some things that I think are genuinely useful. And fundamentally, I would just love it if you all leave this presentation with some sense of possibilities. Almost anything can be an input. There is a surprising amount of possibilities for transforming inputs, and there are a lot of interesting ways to output things. The trick, I think, is to creatively bash things together and build just a muscle of creation, a habit, practice, get some skill at putting these things together. Uh, and that really, really uh, opens up the limits of what can be done. Now, that's it for me. Uh, I am open to questions about how any part of this works or what I've tried with this. I'm happy to discuss any part of it. Hope it was interesting. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we have uh, some time for, for question. I was made aware that uh, probably that might not be um, hearable, uh, audible on YouTube. Um, so that's just another reason to join us um, live next time. Um, <laughs> all right, guys. Uh, who has a question for Lars? Are there any questions here? OK, here's the first one. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I do. Uh, yeah, so my question is, is like the code available anywhere? Like I'm talking about, you know, displaying this audio, having all this text oh, appearing yes. on the screen. And uh, if you could give us a quick glance, I would really appreciate it. Like, <laughs> Yeah, sure. Uh, wait, I'll drop this share and just share in code editor instead. Let's get into something. Some business. Uh, yes, everything is available on my GitHub, so github.com slash um, uh, The entire presentation is available there. I prefer if you don't give it, but take any code you like. Uh, actually, if someone wants to remix the presentation, I'd be curious to see how that goes. Uh, I'm not too, too particular about it. So uh, this has been some of what I've been hacking on. And this is a very, very messy project. It's literally one live view, one membrane pipeline, a separate uh, membrane library for some of the transcription work where I just built some, some utilities. Um, there's an NX serving or a Bumblebee serving thing. No, wait, that's just me exploring NX, Never mind. But essentially it's a live view. And this is the state it keeps. It keeps a reference to the pipeline. Uh, it keeps a list of transcript entries. It keeps the instant transcript separately. It keeps a bunch of levels and it's a map to that matches up with transcript indexes. Uh, there's some reasons to do that, but it's, it's mostly to avoid uh, pulling in too many of the level samples. Uh, there's a counter for which slide I'm on. Uh, the actual sliding is just a JavaScript library I pulled in reveal.js because that's not what I wanted to build. Uh, and there's, I don't think I even used these two. Uh, those are leftovers. Here's some leftovers from me experimenting with, with it on a machine where I couldn't get the microphone input to work. So I just had fake data so I could do some design uh, experimentation on it. But things like uh, I'm grabbing certain things that Whisper will output when if I'm not speaking for a bit. 
this will actually it will output silence 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 and i just map those to nil and then filter out all the nils similarly keyboard clicking clicking blank audio <laughs> typing um, but there's there's nothing fancy here because all i'm getting is text once you have the text it's not particularly difficult it's just like how do i how do i detect the text a substring in a text uh, it's not that difficult if string go contains go to slide there's absolutely nothing smart going on here um, so there's that and then there's the pipeline hold on i need to look behind my camera to actually uh, there we go. Um, and this consists of, uh, well, it can switch between a mic and a file input. In this case, I'm running off of a mic, uh, which uses port the port audio plugin. Then it's an audiometer, the converter, which is makes it a known shape. So a uh, float 32 little endian because Whisper likes those. I timestamp them with a special element I built for that. And then I do the quick transcription, which is the buffer duration of one second. And then I use uh, the other transcription, which takes, uh, well, this is five seconds, but it's variable. And then I actually just dump the data that I'm keeping around. I put it in a fake sync. Um, I link all these up. I handle some notifications. So I've set up Whisper to send me membrane notifications when it completes transcripts. So I get these and I broadcast them and the live view picks them up. There is absolutely nothing particularly weird going on here. Like the weirdest things are building SVG draw commands and counting bytes. Uh, that's, that's about it. So that's a little bit of the code, uh, but everything's available on, on GitHub, uh, the transcription membrane uh, library and this entire presentation. So go for it. It's called lively you'll find it yeah great stuff thanks so my question is um, because it seems you bridge like really a lot of various tools and um, the question is if you had any particular difficulties with like joining this all together and with reasoning about all this stuff uh, or it just went smooth and it, it just like it looks like here. <laughs> it was definitely programming, so it was not all smooth. Uh, doing some of the trickiest things was just, uh, for example, chunking the audio in a way that was useful to whisper. So membrane already uh, chunks things into uh, buffers of a of what it considers a appropriate sizes. I may be, even be able to configure that in some way that I haven't explored. But I built an element that essentially captures the number of seconds of audio, sends that off to Whisper. Uh, it always passes the audio on. It doesn't wait for anything. Uh, so you get the transcript as soon as possible. And the audio pipeline keeps going uh, as fast as it can. But that meant I needed a strategy for sort of how do I figure out where I am in the audio, if I want want them in a particular order and if I want to know when it starts and stops. So one of the things I'm doing is I'm actually showing which second um, a particular transcript starts at because uh, that's something I wanted in the presentation. But essentially once you realize like, oh, wait, I'm actually giving it a very consistent shape here. Uh, these are 32 bit loads at a known sample rate of 16,000 uh, hertz. So 16,000 samples every second and a single channel. Then I know how much data is actually in a second. So then I just have to watch, okay, have we captured that amount of bytes? That means we have five seconds, send it to Whisper, move on. Um, and that bit took me, uh, <laughs> like before I realized how simple it could be, uh, I tried a bunch of things that did not work very well. Uh, so that was probably the trickier part. And, but the really difficult work has been done by the membrane team, by the 
people that do Bumblebee and provide me with Whisper in a way where I don't have to use either Python or FFmpeg. Um, so no particular difficulties with like making things work together once I've wrangled the data correctly. And I think that's one of the challenges in Membrane, like getting the format you need and uh, figuring out how to use it well. Uh, because most of us don't think in audio and video pipelines. Thanks, Ed. Okay, are there any other questions? I don't see anything. Yeah, okay. So, thank you very much, Lars, for joining us. Um, My pleasure. And hope to see you uh, in Lisbon uh, in April. Oh, yeah. Um, head in there. We'll see how what this talk looks like at that point. I think I might have gotten a few ideas. Actually, if you have ideas about what should be in, uh, be mashed up or something you'd like to see, uh, feel free to reach out at Mastodon or email or wherever. I'm pretty available. Elixir Slack works as well. All right. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, now it is time for our second presenter, um, who will be Wojtek, uh, part of our membrane team, um, who will uh, show you um, a bit of a presentation on uh, patterns. Um, yeah, can you? You can uh, get here and set up things. Teraz pytanie, czy to w ogóle to działa z Maciem? Widać, że za często czy się ładnie wszystko szło. Mhm. Masz na tyle prądu? Ja z drugiej strony masz. In the meantime, I can say that uh, the pizza will uh, arrive uh, around uh, um, an hour, I think, like, uh, after the presentations. So please be patient. Um, and of course, you can uh, grab a next beer uh, while we're uh, setting things up. Uh, we're just waiting for the screen share to appear. Turns out this Mac isn't compatible with our hardware. <laughs> Okay, and three, two, one, yay! <laughs>
Success. Okay. Yeah. You can After continue. The stage is yours. So, hi, I'm Vitek, and today I will talk a little bit about design patterns in Elixir. So, uh, throughout the last few months, I have been working on Membrane, and coming from more object-oriented languages into Elixir was quite hard, to say the least. Uh, this is how my first PR looked like, or this is more accurate description of it. Uh, so, the reason why uh, that was the case is because the object-oriented design patterns that I knew from other languages didn't uh, translate that well into uh, functional programming. Uh, so the reason why was that in the functional world we use a little bit different uh, approaches to many things. But half a year later, uh, I was working on some object-oriented uh, st stuff for my uni coursework. And I found out that the design patterns used out there can be some kind of translated into Elixir. Most notably, those two, the observer pattern and the strategy one. So let's look how we can do that. So first talk about what is the observer pattern. So when we talk about observer pattern, we have some kind of object that state is changing, and other objects react to those changes. And instead of well, manually sending all these, managing all these states, uh, we can have a simple solution that uh, will allow other objects to subscribe for any of those changes. So uh, the problem I was solving was a simple uh, evolution simulation where there were a lot of animals on some kind of map that transformed their state, and you need a lot of other components to get notification from that transform state. So uh, in Elixir, we can do that with using processes, and other processes can subscribe to the ones that are the states are transformed, and with allowing simple interface for subscription and unsubscription, uh, and the simple notification uh, function, we can simply send any uh, information about the changes of the state. So the next pattern was the strategy. So strategy pattern is when we have uh, some stuff to do, but in different conditions we want to do it in different ways. But from but from what we call this, we don't actually want to uh, interact with that how, how we actually do that. So in Elixir, we have two ways to do that. The first one is through behaviors. This is a very common approach. You can see it in other languages as well. You just define some behavior, which is like interface or trace from other languages, and then just implement it. Nothing special there. You can keep the module reference uh, in your state and just call these functions, and it will work. But there is more Elixir way to do that uh, with pattern matching. Uh, you can actually have multiple functions uh, which uh, match based on the type that you define. And with that strategy, uh, being placed inside the object, you can basically call those functions, and match on them, and execute the proper algorithm. But with that type definition and posture matching, we get a little bit into the functional world. So let's take a little dive there. So the main things in functional programming are functions. And composing them in different ways is like uh, building Legos. You can uh, attach them in different ways to get different results. And uh, the main part of why Legos are so fun to play with is because you can build multiple things. And you can build multiple things because the Legos are linked with each other. So you can basically attach them in any way you want. And that's why you want to have functional programming, the pure functions that aren't linked with each other, and they just take some input and take some, produce some output. And with types, you can actually define what 
inputs they can have and what outputs they produce. And that's how you can link them. So training functions is quite common. You've probably seen something like this a lot of the time, uh, programming in Elixir, even in previous presentation. But there comes a twist when we want to return something that isn't simply value, but something like result. Uh, returning the OK or error tuple from uh, the function is probably what anyone uh, programming in Elixir seen at some point. And you can just pipe them uh, into the other functions. So what we can do, do with them. So the first thing uh, that comes to mind is spaghetti code ha uh, error handling. And you don't have to program in Elixir to see that this isn't the most readable solution. And the proper one, or the more uh, beautiful looking one, uh, would be something like this, using with do else from uh, Elixir standard library, uh, where you can separate all the logic related to computations with the return logic and all the hel error handling. But it's still not the greatest case because we still, the result from the first function have to assign to some variable just to use it in, in the second line and so on and so on. So we can modify it a little bit and firstly define some simple chain function that will match on those results and based on that it will either execute a function or pass of the, an error further. And right now you can just chain functions just like you would do uh, if those functions wouldn't return the result, but uh, with that you can actually handle the, the, the errors that you want to handle. But all of that was mostly to do things in a beautiful way, but uh, what we really want to do in Elixir is concurrency execution of the program. So remember, why do you even started using Elixir in the first place? It's mostly likely because uh, your team wanted to uh, execute some tasks concurrently, or you want to build some web scale application, or you wanted to build some fault tolerance system. Or the other reason is ju you just watch around the movie SQL and got hooked. Uh, before I move on, there is a quick disclaimer. The rest of this presentation was most likely stalled from uh, Dave and Aston from the Lambda days. But this is what Joseph did with Erlang anyway, so <laughs> 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 let's move on. So the first part so the first pattern is uh, embarrassingly parallel. Uh, you basically have some process that have some jobs to do and they are independent of each other. You, you, so uh, in Elixir, you can just spawn other processes, assign the job to them, and make things done. Uh, the things for, first thing that we uh, notice here is that the jobs are independent of each other, and they don't communicate back into the parent process. So how would you do that, something like this in Elixir? So imagine you have some list of paths to files that you want to transform in some way. Here we do convolution on them. So instead of doing just you know map on each of this uh, and doing it in one process, we can just spawn new processes for all of these uh, files and execute it concurrently. Job done. So when we want to use it, uh, firstly we need independent evaluation of each of those functions. Uh, we need no communication with parent or with between siblings, and there are no shared dependencies between those siblings. If any of those are violated, you probably don't want to use it. Uh, the next pattern is quite common. Uh, you've probably step on them in other languages. Uh, it's called reduction or async await. Uh, and this is similar to the previous one, but in this case, after doing the parallel job, uh, we have some reduction state, st uh, step where we merge the results from the previous jobs or some can combine them. And in this case, we also can spawn the child, child processes, do the job there, and get the result back to the parent process and do the reduction. 
So the same little modified example from the previous one uh, is when we actually transform those images. Instead of just saving them or forgetting about them, we want to merge them into the video. So right now, we not only need to transform those images, but get the result back and merge it in some way. So here we can use a task async from the standard, standard library, uh, do the convolution uh, on them, spawn the new process, uh, get the ref, wait on that ref uh, for set period of time. Here we specify infinity, and then pass the result into the uh, merging function. So when we want to use it. Uh, so Again, we have independent evaluation of each of those jobs. Uh, we have communication with the parent, but there are no communications between there are no communications between children, and there are no shared dependencies between them. Okay, so the last uh, design pattern I want to talk about is pipeline processing. And from the previous presentation, you probably can uh, have a few ideas where I'm going with this. So in pipeline processing, we have some kind of procedure, uh, producer nodes, some producer consumer nodes, and the last consumer node, or there can be multiple consumer nodes. But basic uh, things about it is that the job is done in some kind of uh, separate, separate processes. And the example uh, of that can be just transforming some video. Let's say there's we modify uh, the case from the previous examples once again, and in instead of taking images, now we take some uh, video, we want to parse it, so chop it, in chop it into the uh, frames, then decode it, apply convolution on them, encode it, and save them to the file. Uh, and we can use membrane for that or anything. But there comes the hard part. So the hard part is communicating between those producer-consumer nodes. Uh, because you can easily encounter some overflow errors or some underfetching or overfetching of this data between the nodes. Uh, this is actually the error from membrane core uh, when you get the too large buffer difference between the producers and consumer nodes. So how, you, how, how would you deal with that? So instead of pushing the buffers from, uh, the, from producers to consumers, you would want the consumers to request the buffers in the reverse way. Uh, but doing that is quite hard, uh, because it ideal, ideally you want to have each element working in, uh, on all time, but with just requesting that you can have some underfetching, and you can have some elements waiting for others to process this data. So when we want to use uh, pipeline processing, basically when we have a lot of siblings parent communication, when we have some shared dependencies, and when those states can be easily evaluated, so meaning that, for example, you can read from the file in, in chunks. But doing this is quite hard, and I wouldn't recommend it when you don't have already really well-built tool for that, or you don't want to spend a lot of time on building that tool. So that's all I've got. Uh, hope it wasn't that, that bad, uh, if you have any questions. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. And yeah, uh, maybe we can, if you can stay for a bit, oh. if, uh, do you have uh, any questions for Wojtek? Okay. okay, no, so thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, now it's uh, time for a final um, point of, uh, of our meetup, which obviously uh, is probably the, the reason most of you uh, came. Um, uh, yeah, it's really uh, nice to see uh, so much of you. Uh, so many of you, um, and it's ob obviously going to be um, a QA with um, creator of Elixir, Joseph Valim. Um, if uh, if you're ready, uh, you can you can uh, go here. Um, here's the second microphone. 
Okay. Yeah, no, I won't use the yeah. computer. I'll yeah. just grab a chair, actually. Just a second. I'll just sit oh, okay. here. I want to use the projector, so okay. maybe we can turn on the lights and... Uh, um, can you turn on the lights? Please. Yep. All right, how's everyone going? Good? Wojtek, just one tip. We didn't copy, we are inspired from. <laughs> Yeah, all right. So, like, for those who are watching online, you can also ask questions on the chat. There's oh, a yeah. The cam is the camera pointing there? And then I should. No, I guess. I mean, we'll right, tomorrow. Yeah, maybe I should just go there. Uh, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, I like, will handle that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I think we can. Oh, the camera is moving, so I think uh, we're good. Um, yeah, so we can start. Uh, who has the first question? <laughs> uh, so a question about Elixir 2.0. When and why? Yeah. So no, it, it's it's it, yeah, it's a good question. So um, I have this vision. Like, okay, I'm going to give a, a long answer. Okay. <laughs> so so one of the, Okay, short answer first. I'm trying to make my mind. So there is no, no plans for 2.0 at the moment. And in my mind, if we are going to have a 2.0, it should basically be Elixir, the last version of Elixir 1.0. So let's say like 1.85, but without all the features that we deprecated. So in my ideal world, when we have an Elixir 2.0, if you if you run Elixir, if you run your code on Elixir 1.85 or whatever it's going to be, and you don't have any deprecation warning, then you can run in 2.0 and nothing is going to break. That's my ideal uh, ideal world. Um, and 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 there are a couple reasons for it. Like, all right, okay, we can all dream, right? Like, what are the now the long answer? What are the evidences that we have that this can actually be concrete and and evidences against that. So for me is that like Elixir was designed like to kind of be like a small language that is extensible that you can take to different domains like machine learning, video processing that we're seeing. So the language is a lot of the language is written in Elixir itself and is meant to be like extensible and malleable. So that has so far translated to the fact that, hey, if there is something in Elixir that we feel we need to change that requires Elixir 2.0, right, we can do it now because the language allows to, to, to extend and to change and, and so on. That's basically what we have, we have done. Uh, like, you know, when there is a new approach, we, de we introduce the new approach and with time we deprecate the old one. And hopefully, you know, and we, we keep on like growing the language and hopefully we'll be able to do that and not have something that pushes o, pushes us to release a 2 So that's the general idea. The evidence against that is that, which is a small evidence, so in the 10, 10 years, is it? Wait, 11 years of the language, we only have one issue in the issues tracker that would be a backwards incompatible change. So that's a pretty good record, right? Like in 11 years, there is one. And it's like super minor. It's like the issue is, so we have module attributes in Elixir, right? And then when you do at doc, you can add the documentation for that attribute. So the only thing we'll do is that we'll change if you do like module get attribute of the doc attribute for something, it's going to be a different result. But that's it. Like, how many people are relying on that? It's like, it's a very, very small change. So hopefully 2.0, really long time for now. It's just when we're like, oh, all this craft, all these deprecation things that we have carried throughout the years, we want to, to get rid of them. Then we do it, but definitely not in a hurry. So I'm not expecting it anytime soon. Okay, thanks. Um, who would like to ask the next question? Paulina, can you pass the microphone there? 
So uh, my question is related to Erang and Elixir performance. Um, don't you think that data immutability and message passing made the whole uh, language a little bit slow and uh, limit the number of use cases where Elixir can be successfully used? Um, in particular, have you ever encountered situation where you had to say that Elixir is too slow to implement some problem and you have to pick another language? All right, so do I think all right, there are a couple of questions in there. I'm going to tell one, which is, uh, and do I, do, I think, do I think that's a concern? I'll start with that, and no. And the evidence I can give is that we are running video pipelines in Elixir. We are, um, we are running large machine learning models in Elixir. So we do have a escape hatch, which is pretty much, because you, we can say like, oh, okay, let, we have a escape hatch, which is pretty much, well, when you really need performance, you can always go down to native code, right? And you can write C, and then you're going to get the performance. Which, by the way, even if you look at other languages, other high-level languages like Python and JavaScript, what, they do the same thing, right? And they are, they are mutable, but they still do the same thing. They still fall back to C or something native when they need the performance. So the point I'm trying to make is that, uh, sure, uh, there is a price with being mutable, there is a price with message passing, but even languages, but there is also a price of just being a higher level language in general. And other high level languages, regardless if they are mutable or immutable, they are all reaching out to the same solution, which is, okay, um, let's, let's have some native code. So, that, so, that's, so that's why, generally speaking, that's like, I'm not concerned about this topic. I, I would put this in the same kind of like, we are in a similar position as everybody. But then there's the question then, like, okay, so is this, is this immutability deal and the message passing deal, like, how much does it matter, right? And, uh, and for me, like, um, there are many ways that we can look at um, immutability, but for me, Software that is immutable, or let's say software that reduces mutability, it's easier to understand, right? Because now I'm not like, I do not have an object uh, that I am passing to a method and that mutates the object in an implicit way that I don't know about it. Uh, Joe Armstrong, one of the creators of Erlang, he has a really good quote about object orientation. He says like, in object orientation, you think you're getting a banana, but you are getting a banana and then the gorilla attached to it and then the whole jungle. Exactly because you, know, you pass an object and changing that object or even calling a method on it can have an impact everywhere in the system. Right? So we can also approach the question this other way, like, oh, immutability for me or like avoiding side effects in general, it, it like makes me write better software and software that is easier to maintain. And a lot of people, they're going to put that on a higher priority than performance. Because when you need performance, you can fall back. Right? There is another anecdote that we can, we can give, which is, um, so one of the inspirations that we, we got for starting this whole machine learning thing in Elixir, it's a project called JAX uh, from Python. Has anybody, is anybody familiar with JAX? Is anybody like with machine learning? OK. Right, and this, it's, it's very, and then it was like very, like the, I, I love the project, the project is very interesting, it's a project from Google, uh, and it was like a, an inspiration, <laughs> uh, and it was an inspiration for us, and then we were reading the Jax docs, they were like, it's a Python library, right, and they were like, well, uh, when you are working with Jax, uh, you should treat all Jax data structures as immutable, and then I'm like, huh, right? I, I, I know a language where kind of everything, you don't have to treat it. I know a language where things are actually immutable, right? And then later on, there was a quote like, well, in JAX, you should write your code in a functional style. And then I'm like, oh, I know a language where you can write your code in a functional style. And, that, and, and the reason why is because uh, what they are doing is that when you're writing, when you're using this library in Python, what you do is that 
you say like, look, I want to multiply those two matrices. It's not like multiplying those things at the time, like when you call it, it's actually building a representation of a program that is going to compile to run on the GPU later on. And then they figure out that if you want to build something like that, immutability and functional programming, it's actually a better abstraction. Right, so, um, but yeah, no, there are, but to answer the question, yes, there are also cases where we're like, oh, like, if things were mutable, I would squeeze more performance from this, for sure. And then, and then I either figure something out that I can squeeze that extra thing, right? So there are cases where I would say, okay, immutability would have helped. But generally speaking, for me, it's like the trade-offs are way more in favor of, you know, uh, immutability and message passing. Like, I would, those are the things that I want first, and mutability and the performance, they come second. I hope that makes sense. Cool, thank you. One more? One more? I'm going to stay here. <laughs> <laughs> so, because you mentioned Elixir and X, so I'm uh, curious uh, how much of the code is uh, written in Elixir itself? And uh, is it uh, like everything is written in, in Elixir, or you uh, had to use some already implemented stuff in C or C++? Yeah, so the way NX works is very similar to Jax, again, an inspiration. Uh, so what we do is that in, when you're using NX, we have this thing called DefN, which is like the Elixir function definitions with a N at the end. And it stands for numerical definition. And the code that is in there, we are going to, when, when you call that function, we are going to execute the code that is in there, and we are going to build a representation of this code that is in there, and we are going to give it to a compiler that is written in C, uh, actually C++. And it's the same compiler that TensorFlow from Google uses, and it's the same compiler that TensorFlow Python library uses. So uh, there is, um, yeah, so that's the process. There is a library that is doing like all the compilation to, uh, to CUDA or to ROCAM or even optim you don't need to have a GPU, you can like optimize the CPU. So that we treat like as a, as a black box really, even to the point where you can change that black box if you want. Uh, and then have a different kind of compiler. So yeah, so there is, um, so, so to sum it up, like you write some Elixir code, when you run that code, we build a representation of all like the numerical operations you want to do. We get this operation, we send to a compiler that is written in, in C, C++, and that compiler is going to give us a code that we call, and that's native code, uh, that, or GPU code, and then we call it, and it's going to do things super, super fast. Here's another one. Okay, I got a question from the chat from Austlim on YouTube, from Wojciech Orzakowski. What is the most challenging thing you would like to implement in Elixir or libraries you contribute to? Yeah, I think staying on the same topic, the whole, the whole machine learning thing is probably, I'm not sure if it, if it would be the most challenging, but definitely for the last years has been the, the challenging one because it's, it's a huge domain and it's also a domain that is like, it's in flux all the time. As we know, like every, every week there is something new happening and then you try to, you have to process those news both from like, uh, well, what is happening with my life perspective, but also it's like from like, oh, what is the technology be behind it perspective? And, and I think there are a bunch of like, exciting challenges just in general. I like to say like, I still like, you know, I can't, it's still for me like hard to believe that we have like a subset of Elixir that runs on the GPU. It's something that if you told me like 10 years ago, I would be like, nah, you know, it's, that's, that's a lie, that's not, that won't happen. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I would stick with that answer. But in five years ago, it would have been something different and maybe five years from now it's going to be something else as well, so. Okay, so taking advantage that, that I sat here, um, I, I'll have a question. Um, I, I would like to jump, jump back those uh, like 11 years. Like uh, I was wondering uh, 
what were your thoughts? Like, how come you came up with the idea of bringing to life a new programming language? Yeah, so uh, actually, it's something that many of you uh, may relate with. Um, it was very cold outside. <laughs> and I didn't want to leave the house. Uh, I'm kidding, but partially not. Uh, I, you know, Elixir, like the first, <laughs> the first commits, they were in the middle of winter. It was like uh, the beginning of January. And, uh, you know, um, and for me, like I was already living in Poland and I tried to avoid leaving the house. But uh, the, 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 series the series story, it's more something like um, I was uh, working mostly with Ruby at the time. And at the time, we were already hearing a lot about concurrency. And I was facing issues with uh, trying to write concurrent software or debugging concurrency issues in Ruby. And, uh, and then everybody was saying, like, concurrency is the future, and, and so on. And I was like, well, if this concurrency thing is going to be the future, like, maybe there are better ways of solving those problems that I'm facing right now. Like, maybe there is some other language that, is, that are doing things better. And I like to say, you know, like, that future somewhat became true because, like, you have a wristwatch that has four cores, right? So the whole story is, like, you know, like, uh, people are saying that the way we write software has to be different. We have to write a way, we have to write software that is going to become uh, where concurrency is the first, uh, is one of, of the main concerns of the software. And then, uh, and then I was like, okay, if, if that's happening, I should prepare myself. I started looking around and I say there are like two points of no return for me, like it changed. It changed the way I would think about software. The first one was when I found functional programming. And one of the reasons we're talking about exactly for me today, like functional programming, like the code is easier to maintain because I don't have like things changing everywhere. Uh, but for me at the time, because a lot of the issues that I had uh, that I, I, I was debugging in relation to concurrency, because well, imagine you have two cores, like two CPUs in your machine and they are trying to change some place in memory, right? And then if you don't coordinate properly, if you don't put a lock, it can corrupt that memory. Uh, and then functional programming will say, well, we, we are not mutating things in memory. We are just, it, everything's immutable, we just transform it. And then, and then for me it was obvious, I was like, you know, like all those issues I have been having, like trying to debug, trying to understand, if I was writing it with this functional style, the issue would disappear completely. And for me, I like to say like, that's my favorite way of solving a problem. Because you can solve a problem like, you know, putting a tape in there or like, adding something to it that addresses it, but if you can remove the problem altogether, like the root of the problem altogether, uh, that's better. And I was like, okay, this is great. And then I was like, okay, I have to learn more about functional programming. And so I started to learn more about Haskell, Scala, and eventually I found Erlang. And uh, Erlang for me was, so the thing about Erlang was that, like if we go back 11 years ago, all the languages that were coming up at the time, like Go, Clojure, they all had a concurrency story. Like they're like, oh, you, you can do async. You have like Clojure had the, the, the software transactional memory. Go had the Go routines with channels. So everybody was talking about concurrency. And the thing that stood out about Erlang was that not only they solved the concurrency problem, but they solved the next problem. Because what is the next problem? Imagine that you write a software and you want to run it on your machine and you want if your machine has four or 16 cores, you want that software to be as efficiently as possible. That's the concurrency. But if a machine is not enough, for whatever reason, you need more machines or you, know, uh, you, you want to have some reliability, now you need to have like, several machines working together towards that problem. And that's the distribution. And that Erlang already solved it. And Erlang solved it you know, today. It solved it like four decades ago. right? At the time, it was three decades. And, and I was like, this is, this is awesome because not only it has solved the problems that I want to solve, but for me it solved the next problem as well, which is when I'm going to need distribution. And, and, and that was the reason for Elixir. It's really, if there was no Erlang, I don't think we would, uh, Elixir would exist. And then I just wanted to try different ideas on, on the virtual machine. And from this winter exploration of ideas, uh, you know, some, stuck around, then that's why we have Elixir, pretty much. 
Okay, thanks. And kind of a follow up to that, um, like at the beginning, was that uh, like a side project for you, or at some point you decided like th that uh, you, the existing software and programming languages are no good, and you want a revolution and yeah. create something on your own? Um, so it started as a as a learning project, pretty much, uh, and and the whole history is on GitHub, so you can actually like. Uh, and the first prototype was actually really bad. Um, because I basically I was like, okay, I want to learn more about Erlang and how it works, because I was like, I really want to use this technology, but I needed projects. I needed like ideas to play around, and one of the ideas was uh, creating a programming language, uh, especially because I don't have the computer science background. So I was like, well, might as well like learn how programming languages work while learning how the Erlang virtual machine also works. Like try to to get two birds with one stone. And um, yeah, so at the beginning I was like, okay, I'm just playing around. And then I built a prototype. It had a bunch of like flawed ideas. Like the first version of Elixir was actually object oriented. It was just never released. It was just the prototype that I was experimenting with. And, um, and then with time, and then like this prototype failed, I actually stopped committing with the project. But I was thinking like, oh, okay, like I had those ideas, they were bad, why they were bad, how they could be better. And then I was like playing with these, you know, like just sketching things around. And then eventually I think I came up with like the, the abstractions that I thought, wait, you know, like I think those, those abstractions here, they make sense. So like I did a commit like in January and then, uh, and then I, I was playing with it like just for fun for like three, four months. And then in the next winter, in December, I started committing again with something that is much closer to the Elixir that we have today. It's actually like if you get Elixir 0.5, uh, which is like 11 years old, uh, it already resembles a lot the code. Have. There are like differences, of course, uh, but the code already resembles a lot what we have today. So it was at that moment where I was like, okay, I think I, I came, I think I figure out the abstractions that we need to have in this language and how it's going to work within their language virtual machine. And at that moment, uh, I, I used to work, uh, um, I was co-founder of a consultancy, Platform Attack. And then I went to my co-founders and I was like, hey, can I work on this part-time? And they said yes. So at some point, this was like 2012, I think. Um, they like I had like some part time. So I was doing projects, but you know, I had like, let's say like afternoons to work on Elixir. Uh, they bought the idea, what I wanted to do with it. And, and then when it started working out some years later, I became full time. Thank you. Um, yeah. I believe we have some questions from the chat. Yeah, from Doc Kobakala, I think. Um, seems like the pool of Elixir developers reduces, uh, which can be a red flag for companies evaluating to change their stack when they understand that hiring can be difficult. Um, do you have any initiatives in mind in order to increase the availability of Elixir developers? So um, it seems that the pool is reducing or something like that? Yeah, citation needed, but um, yeah. Yeah, so usually what I say is that, um, and this does not apply to Elixir. Well, my ex it's hard to say if the pool is increasing and reducing, um, if you're going to take it seriously. Like, usually the data that I have, it's, it's actually very hard. Like, people ask, like, how many people are using Elixir? And I'm like, I have no clue, because, uh, like, there is no way for me to collect this data, because there is... Like, I cannot even tell you, like, based on how Elixir is installed, because there are so many ways you can install Elixir, and they are not, and I do not have this, right? But, like, things that we have from, like, events, like, uh, we are going to have, like, Elixir conference in Europe, uh, now in April, and it's going to be the biggest Elixir conference in Europe that we have seen so far, like, by number of attendees. Uh, it's going to be, I don't know if I can give the numbers, but it's the biggest by, like, 20 or 30 percent. So you know, if you're looking at that, it's like, well, it's the pool reducing, maybe, maybe not. So, uh, but going to the question, I think there is there is a good question in there, which is, um, well, you know, how, how are you going to adopt a language and based on or any other technology based on the pool of developers? And the thing is that, like, I talked to some companies where they're like, 
look, we we were using like JavaScript or Ruby before or Python, and then we were having a really hard time hiring. And then when we started doing Elixir, it was actually easier because it was a differential for us because we were competing. Like if you like if you are a company doing any tech stack, right? You are competing with other companies that want to hire Python engineers or uh, JavaScript engineers or C sharp engineers, right? And you have to compete. So, um, and then they said, at the moment we start doing Elixir, that became a differential because the the diagram, the Venn diagram of like. Python developers who are interested in Elixir, that offer became very exciting for them and that worked out. But we also have companies that I heard that they were like, look, uh, somebody, we had a small team doing Elixir and then uh, it was working fine, but uh, you know, like half of the team left, we could not grow the team and uh, we had to eventually replace. So we hear like both kinds of stories. And I think the thing is that uh, it's very hard for us to generalize I think a company, when they are adopting a technology, um, they have to consider, like, you know, how we're going to reach the developers, right? Like, uh, how, e even if it's Python, right? Like, well, you know, if you are a Python company where you're trying to hire in San Francisco, it's going to be a very different story, a very different competition if you're trying to, to hire remote in Europe. Right, so you have to consider all those factors. How you're going to reach out with the community? How you know, like even the domain that you're working on. So, for example, you can get something like crypto. There are some communities that may be more open to crypto, where other communities are like, yeah, you know, we are not interested in doing crypto stuff. So you have to consider all those things and make an informed decision, right? And not only for companies, this is also uh, for people as well, right? Like if you're saying, hey, you know. Here, I assume that everybody like chose at some point to invest in Elixir, right? But you know, uh, I'll, some run, run into it by accident, but some have to make a choice. Like, look, I'm going to invest my career in this. What are the opportunities that I have around me to work with Elixir? Like, what are the companies? So, um, I think those are the general considerations and, and what you can do. How we can hire? Do we have to teach people? Is our company capable of teaching people? How we have to change? for us to onboard developers. Because one of the things that has happened with Elixir, for example, is because most Elixir in general, right, is that mo Elixir is not the first programming language of most Elixir developers. It's, it's not the first one. So usually people, when they started doing Elixir, they already have some experience. And the companies, for them, it's great because like, okay, we are doing Elixir. And choosing Elixir kind of sets, it's already a filter of people with experience. So they're like, oh, this is great. Like, we are hiring Elixir developers, and they all have experience. They are more senior. So that's very positive for us. And life is so good because when we hire people, they already have years of experience in their back, right? But now you have to, one of the challenges that we have as a community is that we have to break that. If we want to continue growing, we need to be able to onboard developers. Uh, junior developers, people who are just starting programming, coming out of university, and have the mechanisms, have the materials, have the courses for them to grow. And that's something that we have been, uh, they are, that's something that I think two years ago, uh, the community has kind of identified as a pain point. So we have companies like Dockyard, for example, that they are now like uh, building a Dockyard Academy to onboard developers who who, who may have like little programming experience. Uh, I think our, I like to think that our work on Livebook and having a platform where you just double click something and you have Elixir running in your browser and you can type things, get feedback, visual feedback is going to be something to help onboard that experience. So yeah, so uh, to answer the question, again, long answer um, is, I think it's not only about what uh, like the Elixir team is doing. I think it's a question of like what the community as a whole is doing, but also what you as a company, as an employer, right? How are you seeing your company in the ecosystem, and how you're going to to contribute to the onboarding of new developers? Just one last thing to say about this is that the there's also the factor of time, right? So like two years ago, uh, especially with, the, with the, the beginning of the, the pandemic, a lot of things changed, like there was more remote work, which meant was like a good opportunity for somebody, you know, 
in somewhere in the planet to get a, a job elsewhere. And companies, they were overhiring, so it was like everybody was having trouble to hire, right? Uh, there was a lot of competition. And then at that time, like whatever technology you chose as a company, you would struggle with hiring exactly because there was so much competition over hiring. And now, two years later, we have a, it's like a slightly different scenario. Um, some companies tried out the remote, now they're going back, others they're going all in, and we, we've heard that there are, we have been having a bunch of layoffs in the last months, so how that's also going to, to change how companies hire and how people are employed, it's also a factor to consider, just like macroeconomics, and uh, that also, I think, also plays into the answer. Well... I was not expecting to talk about macroeconomics, but sure, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, I think we have like for at least one more uh, question. Like that. I think like we can keep going until pizza comes. Okay, if that sounds good. To, I mean, yeah. like, you can't beat pizza, so I think <laughs> this will be the sign. Yeah? Okay, so yeah. Um, yeah, there's a question. <laughs> so. Okay, so uh, I have a question about uh, static typing. Uh, in particular, how is the work going? And yeah. do you have any results you could share us with? Uh, for example, maybe at the moment you know that uh, there will be nothing with uh, static typing or, or maybe yeah. the other way around. That's a very good question. To answer, we'll have to turn off the camera. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so, um, so to... Make sure everybody's on the same page. We started uh, a really research and development project for bringing static types into Elixir. And as a research and development project, there are two steps. There is the research part and there is the development part. And we have, I'm very happy to say that we are like at the last part of the research thing. Okay, so what this means, so what, what is this research? Basically, we, there is a type system. Uh, there are several types of type systems, uh, and we are working with one which is based on set theoretic types, which I find, I personally find very intuitive because it's, everything is based around set operations that we learn like school or high school or something like that, right? Like it's like unions of sets, like intersections of sets. And so I find it's, it's very intuitive and the, and the whole research is like, well, can set theoretic types apply to Elixir? And to answer this question, we, we break into two things, which is, well, what are the things that we can do with Elixir today that we can model with set theoretic types, right? So if you say, look, this function can return like an integer or a float, a number, right? That's a union between integers and union integers and floats, right? So it's integer or float, that's what you get. So the work is like applying everything that you can do with Elixir, like think about case, pattern matching, guards, intersections, protocols, behaviors. We look at everything the language can do, all the data types, maps, lists, tuples, and like how can we model all those things with set theoretic types? So we did that, and when we did that, they were like, okay, this works for saturatic types, but there are those things in the language that uh, we don't know how to model them. And now we have to do research. We have to answer the question, like, all, all those things that we don't know how to do, can, can we figure out a way of doing it? So, and some of those are big, like, uh, can we type all of the guards with saturatic types? Guards are very important with Elixir, and if we can't do that, then the solution is not going to be good for us. Another one was with maps. So we, we did this work of like what works, what doesn't work, and then we were like, okay, these areas we have to research further and improve the theory, improve the set theoretic type theory so we can type those Elixir constructions and data types. And we did that. And uh, we've, uh, we, in this case, does not include me because it's like, it's mathematical work. Uh, so uh, Guillaume Duboc, which is the PhD student, and uh, his tutor, is that the correct word? Uh, the, uh, the researcher, uh, Giuseppe Castanha, they are the one working on this, and uh, they figure out those hard problems, and uh, they are writing papers right now. So, you know, we can, they can publish uh, the papers, and then it's going to go to, like, 
academic conferences where people can validate those ideas, see if they make sense. And, and, and that's, so that's where we're at now. Like we are writing papers and we're going to write a, something that is called a position paper. It's just like a high level overview of everything that we have been doing. And this one is we because I've written a little bit. Uh, um, and I, I hope you're going to have it out like relatively soon, let's say in the next three months. So that's where we are. And then we finish publishing those papers. We, it's going to validate. Maybe people are going to find things to improve. And then we can hand into development, right? So that's the stage where we are. So, and then when we're going to develop, we're going to find a bunch of other challenges. Like maybe we're going to start implementing. They're like, oh my God, like it's super slow. We have to figure out ways to optimize. And maybe we won't figure out a way to optimize. And maybe the whole idea will have to throw it out. And, research maybe something else, another type of system. But that's why right now, like research, we've, we, did, we did the research work and now we are finishing it up, like publishing the things that we need to do, get, getting some uh, theoretical uh, validation. And then we can start with the development, which is also going to be like a long term thing, but you know, um, not committing with, with anything, but I think like in a year for now, maybe we are going to have like some beginnings of uh, set theoretic types in the Elixir compiler. You as a developer are probably not going to interact with it yet, but the Elixir compiler may start to know about those things and start to, to reason about your code in a different way. And we'll start assessing like, how does that impact the compiler? Does it make things slower? Does it make things faster? Can it find some bugs for free? You know, and and yeah. So that's where we are in this journey, um, going from research into development. Um, yeah. Thanks for asking. Okay, there was another question. Yeah. Uh, so just by looking at your like GitHub activity, we can see that you take part in a lot of projects like uh, Core Elixir and other stuff like Ecto and so on. Uh, I myself remember putting some uh, PR to Livebook at Sunday 11 p.m. and you responded like in three minutes. So my question is, when do you sleep? Um, yeah, so uh, that I usually, I'm not at the computer at, uh, 11 p.m. on a Sunday, uh, but I I do have kids, so this this could have been like um, the answer. Short answer: When I sleep is when my kids let me. That would be that would be the the most appropriate answer. Uh, but sometimes you know it just happens that like. They wake up and then you know I lose my sleep, so I'm I'm going to do like some phone browsing or email browsing until I can recover some sense of sleep, I guess. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, I try you know outside of that, I try to 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 live a normal life. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, thanks. Um, there's one more. Okay, so I wanted to ask, are there any plans for improvements of Elixir language server or any official support for any IDE? Because uh, sometimes writing in Elixir, even with like great tools like Mix or Hex, feels a little bit like writing in Notepad when you don't have a lot of uh, features from other languages like automatic functions renames or variables renames and stuff like that. Yeah, so um, we Dashbit supports uh, Ukash, who is one of the maintainers. Like we support Ukash to work on it part time, um, and I I recommend everybody to to get involved. It's an open source project, so um, you know, like get involved. There's probably already a community around this, like um, that is thinking about those problems. I think we. I think we recently, we, they, um, they recently added like the first refactoring, which was like convert from pipeline into pipeline or something like that. So some base work happened and now maybe they are starting to, to, to do more of that and we can start having like more refactorings, bigger names and so on. Uh, the other thing is that um, with working on, on Livebook, 
um, is that uh, we started incorporating some some of the language server things um, into started to incorporate some of the language the, the language server things into Elixir itself to make a uh, life of the Elixir language server developers easier because what they had to do is that some of the things like require you to know how Elixir parses things so they would use private APIs and then there was a new Elixir version and then because it was a private API like that would change and it would break and so you know some pieces of the code like they have like four or five conditionals about doing things in a different way so what happened is that when we started working on Livebook it turns out that like Jonathan he was implementing the feature for Livebook which I had implemented in IEX, and Marlos, which was one of the one of the initial people working on the tooling around the language server, he was also working at Dashbit, so he implemented that at the language server, so uh, to be used for the language server. So we had like uh, three people at the same company that implemented the same thing uh, three times, uh, and they were like, okay, it's enough. Like there is plenty of evidence that. Um, we can start sharing some of the work. So that's when we, so we have a module in Elixir called code.fragment because the hard thing about an editor, so Elixir, it's like when we have to understand your code, like when we have to compile your code, we are always working under the assumption that your code is correct. Like there is no syntax error. And if there is no syntax error, we are just going to say like, yo, this is bad, fix it. I won't continue until you fix it, right? The hard thing about an editor is that even if the code is incomplete, it has a syntax error, it's invalid for a compiler, it makes no sense whatsoever, the editor is still needs to make sense of that and give suggestions because the user is relying on your suggestion for them to fix what is wrong. So, um, so that's the hard part. Uh, so, so we have this module in Elixir now called Code Fragment, which is exactly to reason about fragments of code, code that is incomplete, and how we can reason about this, and which information we can get about it. So we are starting to improve, but this is still like, at a, like we are working at the base level, and I feel like some of the features that you mentioned, they are like from the top level, and, so, and I think like the community should like step in and and help figuring out. Um, and I think it can actually be super fun because like working with compilers, parsers, it's like this is the kind of work that you usually, you, you don't do at work, let's say, right? It's like it's a different domain. So it can be very challenging and exciting. So uh, I do recommend like exploring around. Okay, so maybe be, be, before we uh, jump once again to Miho, um, I have a, <laughs> uh, I have a one more question. Uh, like, uh, could you share some updates on what's next for the Elixir for the upcoming versions? What's the the current focus? Oh yeah, um, yeah. I was like, I was writing the because the next Elixir version is going to be soon in two months, and I was writing the change log and. I think this is going to be our most boring release ever. Uh, there isn't really like a lot of things. It may be exciting if you have a really, really large Elixir application, like thousands of files, because some of the, I've spent like the last, I spent a lot of time in the last weeks, like uh, I, I got access, somebody say, hey, the compiler is slower. Then I'm like, oh, sh sure, like how many files do you have? They're like 2,000. I'm like, oh, okay, this is great. And I was like, can I get access so I can play with it? So I have been playing, like uh, I got access to two really large applications and I have been debugging them to make the compiler faster. Because when you are at this point, like when you have like 2,000 files, right? Like bottlenecks, they start showing up. Uh, in place you don't expect. So for example, one of the bugs that I found was that we were, like the compiler was calling a file, was calling like ls, you know the list directory command from Unix, was calling that in the directory. And it turns out that if you have 2,000 files, you're going to have like 2,000 beam files. And now calling ls, it's something that you, everybody's going to assume it's going to be fast. I'm just listing the files in this directory. Now that thing becomes slow. 
So you have to rethink the algorithm, and you have to rethink in a way that it's going to be fast when you have a lot of files, and it's not going to now become slower for things that are only have 20 files. You don't want to make everything else uh, pay the price. So um, I, think, I think that's the thing. Like, there are a lot of improvements, both in OTP and in Elixir, for like, making the compiler faster and making like, so for example, when you, if you do like mixed test, there is some time while we are booting everything for us to see the result of running the first test. Also making that shorter, right? Like instead of, like I've, I've seen some improvements in the work I've, I've seen uh, that I've done so far where it's like 30% faster. So, you know, uh, if before it would take like four seconds, it's going to take like 2.8 seconds for you to see like the first dot, which it's, for me, it's like it's, it's a very meaningful game. So that's going to be the exciting things. There is, I think, everything else that is exciting that is happening is happening outside of the community. You know, with uh, Livebook, with machine learning. There was a new Phoenix release now with focusing on on Hicks. There is probably main brain stuff coming out. I think most of the exciting things exciting things are elsewhere. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I think that's going to be the last question. Like judging by the uh, uh, what's going on behind there, so Michal. Okay. okay, so uh, I wanted to ask about Elixir and X. Uh, does Elixir and X uh, have any production deployments? Um, I'm 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 sorting for information that I can talk about. Okay, so the answer is yes, but I'm trying to see which one I can talk about. Um, did anybody see like the Chris, Christopher Granger keynote at Elixir Conference in the United States? Yeah, I'm almost sure that he, that's public, and I'm almost sure that he talked that he's using both an X and Explorer. And there, and I know of another case that I am working to make it public. Um, yeah, so I, I think I know. Yeah, so the answer is yes. But you, you can, you can probably count on both hands. That's where we are. The goal is to count on both hands and both feet, and then move on from there. Yeah. Baby steps. Okay, so thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot everybody for, for joining. Um, yeah, mm, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and wrapping up the uh, the the meetup, uh, you can uh, find the pizza over there, I think. Uh, so, thank you all for attending, and uh, have a good time. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>